Above the lintel of the first pylon of the temple is the inscription of the Roman Emperor Trajan, which records the information of the commander-in-chief of the garrison here at that time, indicating the Roman control of the area in the past and the importance of the site in the Roman period. You have to know that Egypt is a special existence within the territory of the entire Roman Empire, it is regarded as the private estate belonging to the Roman emperors. After passing through the first pylon, you come to the first courtyard. Five broken columns can be seen here, and part of the courtyard has been covered by sand. Further ahead, is the second sandstone pylon with a solemn and elegant flying sun disk above the lintel. After passing through the second pylon, we came to the second courtyard. The area here is smaller than that of the first courtyard. In the courtyard, we can see the column heads placed in the corners. The engravings on the flowers and plants above are still clearly recognizable. The stone carvings on the walls depict scenes of Roman emperors offering sacrifices to the Egyptian gods such as Osiris and Isis. Further on is the best preserved part of the temple. After passing through the third gate, you will come to a small hypostyle hall with only four columns. Like most abandoned temples, it has become home to bats and smells like bat droppings. At the end of the hall is the sanctuary of the temple, which has a vaulted dome, unlike those in the Nile Valley. There is a room on either side of the sanctuary, and they also have vaulted domes. Above the lintel of the cylindrical vault of the sanctuary, the Egyptian goddess of the vulture is carved. Go back to the hypostyle hall and you will find a narrow staircase leading to the roof on the left side of the hall. Going up the stairs, you come to the temple's roof. Where you can see a small backyard between the sanctuary and the back wall of the temple. There is also a good place to enjoy the views of the interior structures of the fortress. Researchers have found numerous artifacts in and around the temple's courtyard, including pottery, coins, and jewelry. Many of these pottery pieces date back to the Persian period. There are also potteries inscribed with Greek and Latin letters that appear to date from the 4th to early 5th centuries. Among the most interesting finds are letters, receipts, garrison lists, and bills. These documents help us piece together the lives of people in Douche. It is a pity that the time was limited, and it was too late to explore the interior of the fortress. On the east side of the second courtyard, there is a corridor leading to the backyard south of the sanctuary. On the west side, there is a passage leading to the fortress.
The scene in front of me is like a dream, which is nostalgic. This temple is like a time tunnel that has taken me through the millennia. To the southeast of the temple, there is a larger cemetery that stretches down to the eastern cliffs. Looking east from the Temple of Douche, you can see the uplifted cliffs on the plain in the distance. The road to Douche is the eastward branch of Darb al Arbain. Caravans travel eastward from the village of Douche to the Nile Valley. After rising from the depression, the road was difficult, full of ravines and desolate terrain, and the caravan had to climb steep slopes up to 400 meters high and a series of mountain passes. In those days, driving camels and donkeys with large consignments across mountain passes was no easy task. But this road has road signs made of stone blocks. It splits into two branches about two-thirds of the way, the northern route to Esna and the southern route to Edfu. There are ruins of ancient burial grounds in the north and west of the fortress. Its style is similar to that of the Bhagwat Cemetery in Karga Oasis. But the tombs here date back to the late Ptolemaic period and are undecorated. The old man and his two dogs kept escorting me back to the car. When going down the mountain, the old man especially showed me the photo of the horned viper and told me that if you visit somewhere in the desert at night, you must be careful of this poisonous snake. After walking down the hill, I asked him if he could show me the building of the French Institute of Oriental Archaeology. He shook his head and said that he is in charge of guarding and maintaining the Institute's house after the French had withdrawn. Although it has been 11 years, the French still haven't come back but visitors are not allowed to enter without the permission of the French. After hearing this, I can't help but be in awe of Egypt's awareness of antiquity's protection. Whether it's the more than 2,000-year-old fortresses and temples, or the French Institute that has been abandoned for 11 years, they are all well protected. In such a lonely and desolate desert, this poor old man accompanied these spiritual wealth days and nights, guarding these common treasures of human civilization for the world. Although I only got along with the old man for less than 10 minutes, I was very reluctant to say goodbye. I wish him good health and hope to see him again. Guided by the afterglow of the setting sun and the Jupiter, I drove all the way north. <laughs> Kushi 